Okay, it is 2.30. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to this session. This session is building collaboration through engaging discussions, something that is a struggle for everyone, something that we've all struggled with on our own, and I'm sure we've all come up with various con uh, conclusions and ideas, solutions. Kathy Booth is going to share with us some ideas that she's found. Kathy Booth teaches for Southeastern Oklahoma State University, which is my home as well. So I'm very excited to hear from her. She is um, she teaches in the special ed program and mainly graduate students, right? Yep. Do you do all, all grad? All right. So she teaches for the. Oh, no, you do both. I do both. Yeah, okay. I have one one group of undergraduates online, okay. though. Oh, all right. I thought no, you were like all grad. So full spectrum and discussions for undergrad are typically a little different than graduate, but I don't know, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to turn the time over to her and we'll hear the great ideas she has to share. All right. Um, thank you all for coming. I know I think this is the last one of the day. So Hopefully, um, this does not disappoint. I know some of you had had some, some good sessions previous. So um, like Crystal has said, I am uh, Kathy Booth. I'm from Southeastern. I am our program coordinator and associate professor of special education um, in our education department. And I um, have been teaching online, I would say, oh, 2017. So is that six years? Um, fully online in our graduate courses um, that went fully online in 2017. Yeah. And then I dabbled here and there in distance learning and um, online from about 2011 on up to 2017. But 2017, I fully got um, engrossed, I guess, in online learning. And um, I've learned some things. I'm still learning so much. Um, and so I'm going to just share with you um, just kind of where the idea of universal design for learning. Um, and so just to give you kind of the background of, of why I've um, started making changes to my discussion boards. Um, and this actually says identify six discussion types, but I actually narrowed it down to five. So I apologize for my typo that never got changed. Um, and then hopefully that you guys will be able to come up with maybe something new or not, a way to tweak um, something that you've been doing as a discussion. So um, I started doing research um, on universal design for learning, which came from um, universal design for those who do not know. Um, and it's basically the cast um, has a website and they they define it as a framework guiding the design of our instructional goals, our assessments, our methods and materials that we customize to meet the needs of all, all our students. And we know that our universities, they, we're growing, they're diverse, um, diverse student populations. Um, and so we have to figure out how do we meet the needs of those students. And um, as, as a teacher educator, this is something that I try to make sure all my students understand is, you know, we're not just kind of teaching to the, the middle, the average student anymore. We have to meet those other needs. And by starting to implement universal design for learning, you can meet those needs. Um, and so there's three principles that UDL follows. Um, one is multiple means of engagement. And most of um, the discussion types will, will give us um, this engagement piece. And all this is, is finding different ways, um, creative ways that we can engage our students. I um, remember taking courses, and this is one thing that really got me going with my how to do coursework um, when creating my online courses. I took some college classes, um, I will not tell you where, um, but it was, I wasn't engaged. I didn't really have to do anything. It was, you know, here's your chapters now, you know, answer these questions type of thing. And I had enough experience that I didn't, I didn't have to do any, I didn't have to read it. And so there was no engagement. I kind of just went through the motions. And that is something that I swore I was not going to let my students do. I swore up and down, by golly, they can hate me all they want, but they are not going to just not do anything. 
So um, I really want to find those ways um, that they actually have to um, engage with the content and with the material we're talking about. Um, and then the second principle is multiple means of representation. And um, as I've done a lot of QM trainings, I see a lot of UDL in those uh, QM rubrics. And so the multiple means of representation, that's just finding different ways to represent your materials. Um, and so, you know, it could be a video, it could be reading, whatever. Um, and then it can go all outside of that on how they interact with you or you interact with them in office hours and that type of thing. Um, and then multiple means of action and expression as we go through some of the discussion types, you'll see that. Um, that is about providing choice. Um, as a teacher educator, one of the, um, the areas that I really like is love and logic. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but it talks a lot about providing um, kids, students choice. Um, and we all like choice, right? I, you know, even in uh, when I taught middle school, I was like, do you want to sit on the floor or do you want to stand? You know, like, I don't care where you do it. Um, and the same premise with action and expression. I don't care how you give me the information. If that's not the point, I just want to know that you have the information and you're understanding what we're talking about. So you have to really kind of think about is is the median on the medium of how they give you the information, the important piece or not. So all of that to say, these three areas and the idea of universal design for learning has got me thinking about my assignments and then my discussions. And so um, a colleague of mine from Colorado um, and I have done, um, we both teach fully online. And so we've really started delving into how can we make these discussions um, more exciting. And so these are the five that we're gonna talk about. So debate, jigsaw, video-based, creative, products and then choice based. Um, so do any of you, and I don't know how talkative you guys are, um, do, have any of you guys ever used like a debate in your, as a discussion in your online classes? I have tried. You have, you've tried. And, you know, I, I'm learning this one still. I am not an expert at it. So any of you guys that have expertise in this, throw it out at me. Um, as an education teacher, um, we find that there are, there's a lot of controversy. <laughs> Hard to believe, I know. Um, and so building in these debates where your students need to see both sides of something and then come to those conclusions on their own. And so we just pulled some research and we found that it um, increases the student engagement and motivation. They, once you get them used to debates, um, they, they get excited and they really want to um, share their information on what they found on their side. So um, with this, it helps build that community in the in your classroom. And I know um, sometimes we struggle. I told you guys when I took those classes, we didn't have to do a lot um, or I didn't have to do a lot. So I wasn't engaged and I didn't talk to any of the students in the class. And that's another thing. I want my students to engage in, with each other. Um, I guess lucky for me, they have group me, but that's a whole other story. But um, it's a way, creating these debates is a way for them to um, work together and to collaborate um, on their side of the debate. And you can do this as groups. You can do this individually. Um, it's really good for those controversial topics um, that you may have in your field, whatever that may be. Um, but some things that as we have worked on debates that we've thought about um, that you want to do is create a clear prompt for the discussion. Right? They need to know um, what is it I need to research and what stance am I taking? And so in the ones I've done, I've divided them and I'm like, A through M, you're going to do this. And, you know, N through Z, you're going to do this. Sometimes we'll let, I let them choose. It really just kind of depends on the topic, the course, how many students I have. Um, so we talked about dividing the students and then making sure that as you create this debate, that it's ongoing. I think many times when we do our discussions, what do they do? They go in, they write their response, and then they go answer their three peers, and then they're done. And so really focusing on the 
and on ongoing piece. And so making sure that they, they provide their opening argument, that as their peer responses, they're doing the rebuttals. Um, and then they end with that concluding argument. And it could be something that the week, if you only do it for one week, maybe you do, um, you say certain days you need to come in and do this. Um, I see some things in the chat, sorry. Definitely, I like that they you found other points. Um, and and that's the point, you know, I do one, and I don't know the fields y'all are in, but one of the big things in schools, but if you're a parent, you know, those clip charts that teachers have in their classrooms and they move their little things up and down, up and down. Well, I'm gonna tell you, I don't like them. Um, and <laughs> yet we still use them, neither here nor there. And so that is one of the, the debates that I have my students do. And it's really helped my students who think it's a good idea to see the other side about why that might really not Kathy, I think you froze. Can you hear us? What a debate, I kind of how I set up a debate for um, students. And I will tell you the students when they don't agree with the position, I had a lot of fights, not fights, that's the wrong word, um, a lot of pushback on, but I only see it this way. And so they had to really research um, and dig into the other side of that, which I think helps them learn and grow. Um, and then they're engaged in this material, you, you hope. Some will still do, you know, the bare minimum. But uh, the next one is the jigsaw discussion. And so um, the research has shown that this increases student learning without increasing the amount of work. Um, and then it helps our students master the content. So I don't know if any of you guys are familiar, but this is basically um, a type of discussion where students teach each other the content. Um, and so there's different ways you can put this together. Um, I found that this is useful when I have students who, or when I have a lot of content and I teach seven week courses and we can't cover it all. And so um, I try to give, you know, certain topics and say, okay, I need you guys to research this and then you're gonna teach the class type of thing. Um, whether they do a recorded professional development type of presentation or they put something um, together like an infographic or um, in the discussion boards. So um, things to think about when you do this is making sure that you have clear guidelines um, and you ask students to provide summaries so that they can take those summaries and they have them for when they need more information. And I like this um, for us because I always teach my teachers that you need a toolbox, you need, um, different, you need as many ideas and um, examples of things. So you can always be pulling and you don't always have to do the research behind it. Um, so that's one thing to think about. The other is you may decide to create discussion groups. Um, and then each student answers a question for the group. Um, and then everyone else furthers to the discussion. So you can have it by groups, you can have it one person. Um, at a time. And then as a group or individually, they create this product to share with the class. And I love having students share their products. Um, just so, like I said earlier, there's, they get different, they did get different ideas on how to do things. Um, and so different types of jigsaw puzzles could be written discussions. I do something based off the SIDL website. Um, and it's a teacher sizzle. And I put the example on here. Um, and basically, I go over um, evidence-based practices, so different research things, um, strategies that they have to use in their classrooms. And so this, there's a lot of them. So I have them all identify their practice that they want. Um, and then they do a video where, and if you're not familiar with SIDL and these sizzles, SIDL sizzles, um, the website's on there, but they basically are cooking something. 
um, that they can relate to their topic. And then they um, discuss the topic while they're cooking and they kind of make the connection between like the ingredients and the parts of the, the topic that they're covering. Um, and so in this, I just kind of say, here's what you need to include. Um, and then they re record these and then that communication goes back and forth on the discussions. Uh, another thing I do is uh, group projects um, and one is a book study. Um, and they'll, they all read books in groups. And then at the end, they switch and they present their book to each group member, which is another type of jigsaw. Um, Video-based discussion. So I know there's a session tomorrow on flip. Um, and so same type of thing. Um, so creating these video-based discussions kind of um, increases that sense of community and engagement. Uh, it's good for concepts that need modeled um, or you want a quick way maybe to get information out. And so for video-based discussions, we found that it's important to make sure that we give those step-by-step -step directions. Um, maybe provide an example video of, um, of what it would look like and then those providing those guidelines for expectations. Things such as video length and format, um, because you don't, depending on your class size, I have about 60 in my classes. So, you know, I don't want like 30 minute, 60, 30 minute videos. And so making sure, you know, that all of that is spelled out. Um, and so different types of video based discussions, um, infomercials, I just started that last summer. Um, I just had my students, um, they had the option of doing a TikTok and I was kind of amazed. Only one of my 60 did it. And so I was like, hmm, that's interesting because I thought they had all want to do that over whatever the other choice was. But um, video, video modeling, um, task analysis, where we take step by step, um, analyzing each step in a process, um, even student introductions. Those are video based um, discussions and doing those out in the community, you know, making sure they don't all have to be, you know, us sitting in our office being all proper as our example. Um, so those are just some different video-based discussions. This is one I did for a task analysis. Um, so the next section or the next type is just creative products. And I don't know um, how you guys do discussions, but like I said, many times mine were all written and they, we just wrote, we included our citations and we moved on and there wasn't much engagement, right? You read your three um, and then you'd be done. But when we're able to um, be more creative in, in what they are providing, we see that our students wanna read more, right? Because it's not just let me read a paragraph like I'm reading a research article or something. And so. Um, we find that this increases student and faculty engagement and we wanna be engaged and all of these actually create that faculty engagement and makes grading more enjoyable, right? Um, I started, stopped doing a lot of papers um, as assignments and then regular discussions because I just got tired of reading bad grammar and bad sentence, just, I didn't enjoy it. So I was like, let's do something fun um, that's a little more creative. So. Um, we also find that visual images, uh, visual aids enhance um, our student learning and student motivation. And so one thing that these creative products are good for is when we need to highlight um, specific important information. Um, and so the things when you decide, yeah, I'm going to start trying to do something create more creative in my classes, make sure that you're providing examples. It's amazing how students, you think, well, they know how to make an infomercial. They know how to make an infographic. They know how to, well, they don't. And as some of, some of you guys may experience, the younger ones might, but some of our non-traditional students don't. Um, and so I have, I have students who are older than me. And so, you know, trying to teach them that technology piece. Uh, making sure that they have those examples, um, making sure that your students know the purpose. Why, why are we doing this? Why is this, why does this have to be done as a discussion? Um, what tools are needed? So making sure that they have videos, even if you don't go 
through exactly what they need? Do they have a place to go to find resources on how to use these different products? Um, and then talking about um, as you have your students respond to each other, making sure they know what it needs to be included in their feedback. I think sometimes we just assume they know um, things to think about. And I've found that the more I tell them here, think about this, think about this, they give a little more in their responses. Um, and so infographics, word clouds are another good way, um, creative way to kind of get some information out. Um, having students do newsletters or how-to guides. And once again, when we do these creative products, um, students are seeing how other students um, are interpreting things and coming up with ideas that, um, for me, I'm trying to give the students ideas that they can carry into their classroom, right? So I'm teaching them how to do these word clouds, these infographics, so that they can then go use them with their own students. And so trying to figure out how will that work for you in whatever field that you're teaching. Um, and so here's an example that I had them do on an infographic. Um, and my infographic information as I have gone through has gotten more detailed and more detailed and now I have its own Google folder um, with information. But this is just an example. And like I said, you can access that on the uh, website. And then the last one is choice-based discussion. So I said earlier that I am a proponent of choice um, when it doesn't matter the medium of how they give me that information. And so um, we find that this aligns very well with UDL specifically the action and expression, changing up how they respond and show you, demonstrate their knowledge. Um, so thinking about um, what is the purpose of your assignment and the best way for the students to get that information out to you. Um, making sure you provide choices that you're okay with um, and that you're not gonna be, that you're like, that. Finding choices that actually are going to give you the information you need. How about that? Um, and then I like giving my students an option. Um, I figure they're graduate students, most of them. And so letting them choose. And then, I, of course, I approve it. Um, and I've gotten some great stuff. I've had students who have done, like, wrote out and did a puppet show acted out a puppet show. One wrote a book of poetry over something. Um, they're probably my, my favorite discussions. Um, I've also incorporated this as an assignment um, where they can do different things. Making sure um, also that you include how to provide feedback to your students. So what is it you're looking for when they respond to their peers? Um, Knowing that that choice can be with the initial post, but it can also be with how they respond. So maybe you allow them to do um, audio responses instead of just the normal typing out, or they do a video and post that. So um, that choice can be embedded in either section. Um, and then once again, making sure your grading criteria is um, clear for your students. So some choice based, I've done our word clouds or an infographic, they'll give you the same information, um, an infomercial or a TikTok, um, and then changing up how they respond. Do we want to, you know, maybe having them do it in a Padlet or I know they used Jamboard earlier today, um, but finding different ways to allow them to respond to their peers. Um, that way they can do it, you know, if you can, if you're okay with them responding in a video, Think about it. Where are students doing some of their work? If they can, if they have to type it out, they have to be at their computer or their phone, right? And somewhere where they can access that, where they might be able to respond to a discussion in the pickup line, picking up their kids because they can use the phone and you know record their their response. So really thinking about what's going to meet the needs of your students when you create um, these diff all, di all the different types of discussions, the choice based especially. Um, here's an example. Um, and just some final points on that. Um, like I said before, making sure the expectations are clear um, and you have that clear grading criteria. But the other important piece um, is that we as the instructors are in those discussion boards um, and we participate frequently. 
And hopefully by them seeing us in there, um, and we're in there more because why? We're enjoying what they're doing, their products, et cetera. Um, and so they're gonna follow and they're gonna want to be in those discussions more and more. Um, and you know, my students, I will say, yes, um, my students don't, at, when they take my first class, they're very like gun shy. They're like, no, I don't wanna do this. This is uncomfortable, blah, blah, blah. And by the time they graduate, I've gotten many comments that are like, thank you. Thank you for making me go outside of my comfort zone. Thank you for making me stretch. Um, and so ultimately some of them <laughs> um, like that and they do feel like they are part of the class. Plus that engagement and those discussion responses, peer responses are there more. Plus they get to see you, just not see me, but see their peers as, you know, and especially in those video-based discussions, they get to see those faces and really start connecting with each other, which we miss a lot of in our online. So that was a lot, but I think I hit my 25 minutes. Questions or comments or what are you guys doing in your classes? Is anyone doing any of this? You know, I think an important part of what you're talking about is that the discussion is more than just your initial post and a peer response or two. You need the back and forth. So they've got to go back in beyond the the just the peer response and actually see what people said and continue a conversation. And and it's true. And I hope that by and it works for some students, it doesn't the others. I may update some rubrics for that. You know, how many times did you interact with the discussions? But I, my hope is that the more we do, I do this in my courses and they're doing more fun, fun things, they want to interact more <laughs> and be in those discussion boards. I think for myself, I, I love the idea of doing them, but then the, the back end work of having to keep the help, you know, that we have things on Canvas that helps to track it, but then being able to uh, develop the rubrics solid enough where it's quantifiable and people understand the grade that they get at the end of the day um, and providing those choices is just kind of one of those things I keep trying to work out <laughs> and, and then like having it translate to um, a grade that's also up there with an assignment and showing that they did learn something at it. Cause I I'm in the sciences. So mm -hmm. like, I want them to have these, these skills, um, but just making it practical and quantifiable sometimes is where I kind of get hung up. And I've, I, I've gone back and forth. I don't like, I'm horrible at making rubrics. I'll be honest. They're, not, they're, they're always changing because they're never good enough. Um, but making them um, focus on the content and not how they access that. Um, and so what is it you really want them to get from it. And then I may do like formatting as just a smaller amount, just to make sure that they did, you know, the format that I'm looking for um, and really focus on the content. And then I can just change that content piece for whatever it is we're talking about. That's one way I've done it. The other is I'll have one for like an infomercial if I do that. And I just, I get that exactly how I want it. And I change once again, just the, the piece of the content, um, the specific area that I wanna know that they've learned. I don't know if that helps, but it is, it is a time consuming piece of it. Um, I just try to make it work where I only have to make small changes <laughs> with each assignment. <laughs> Very true. There's also a question in the chat from Michael. Um, while you're looking at that, my thoughts, Michael, so he asks about um, encouraging connections that persist beyond the classroom. And I don't know necessarily about individual connections like friendships, but I do think that there's connections in the kinds of discussions that she talked about that help you connect better to the material and participate in in interacting with the material in a more unique way, if that makes sense. That one of the things I talked to my students about is that they are involved 
in the in the topic that an essay is more than just something especially the ones they're looking up if they're going to look something up from the library those sources they're just a really extended conversation but when they write something about it or when they discuss it in the classroom they're participating in that topic that's what academics really are that they're involved in the subject in some way and so this is a way to be involved and a way to understand how we interact with other people on that subject that they don't get that opportunity in other places Thank I you. think that connections beyond the classroom, that's, you know, there's only so much we, we can do. I will say I do a project, it's not a discussion, but I do um, a book study where I make them meet with their small group every week. And I used to let them do it just through like a, a discussion board or virtually. Well, I've changed it to where they have to meet virtually. And it's probably my students' favorite project because they have to interact um, with their peers. And a lot of them, that's how they keep talking to them after they graduate because they've started working with this small group. And so you can kind of do that same thing with those small groups um, in a discussion. How are you, in, how are you incentivizing that? Uh, let me rephrase the question. How are you making it a requirement which? To participate in an online meeting with stu uh, among students, because my students are now so like all with over the, the book region. study. Yes, um, it's part of their grade, <laughs> but they pick their group um, picks the best day and time for that mm -hmm. group. Okay, and I I haven't had pushback yet. Um, after doing it a couple semesters, um, they just, and some of them, they'll have to miss a meeting or something, but it's something the group works with to put together what's going to work best for them. The other thing I do is their introduction for that class is a draft card. Um, one of my students said it was similar to um, like a dating app or speed dating or something, because it talks about, you know, it asks them, what kind of student am I? When are the best times for me to work? And it asks a lot of those questions that you want to know in a group member. And so that's how they can choose their groups. So it is 302. This was a great session. Thank you so much, Kathy. Lots of good ideas, lots of discussion after. You can continue to talk if you want, but officially today's session is over. But we hope that we will see a lot of you again tomorrow for more sessions of OKLIS. Thank you. Thank you all. Good job, Kathy. Thanks. You'll have a good one. Unless you have something else you want to ask or say. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're done. All right. <laughs> They're like, nope, 302, I'm out. <laughs> Bye. Bye, thanks. Good to see you. Good seeing you.